vulnerable to the downside of each of these four things. Because there's no question, this is a challenging period of life for everybody. You know, it's challenging for uh, adolescents. I remember, let me just change a couple things for confidentiality purposes. Um, <laughs> A, a friend of my son, when he was young, um, <laughs> got mad at her parents when the two of them were about 14. Um, and uh, she lives, she lived, uh, or lives about four miles away from a very dark place on a mountain, down a mountain, through a very rough place where cars are going by. And at one in the morning, she shows up in her pajamas at our house. Right? So my son is, gets up, because he, you know, she's throwing things in his window, whatever. So the two of them are down there, so I get up, and I said, what's going on here? And she's in her pajamas. I said, how'd you get here? She goes, I walked. I go, you're a 14-year-old young lady, and you walked in your pajamas down that road? She goes, yeah. I said, someone could have picked you up. She goes, someone did try to throw me in his car. Okay. Does your mom know you're here? No. I said, well, you know, we should call your parents. And she goes, I don't know, I'm really mad at them. You know? And she tells this story, and I won't get into details, but the bottom line is her parents said something that got her angry, so she decided to go for this walk um, and come to our house. Um, and so one of the parents came over, and we had a therapy session that night. <laughs> which was very funny, because her mom was a therapist. <laughs> and we laugh about it now a lot. <laughs> Anyway, they all survived, which is great, thank God. So, um, but the point is, she just got filled with a huge emotion, being mad at her parents. And it's interesting, so the first of the ES is emotional spark. Studies of the brains of adolescents show that the lower areas of the brain, and if you take out your, um, your, your hand, I want you to reach below your chair. The sponsors of this talk were so sweet, they came to this auditorium ahead of time. And they took that blue tape and take a model of the brain underneath your chair that you can take home with you. So if you reach under the chair and uh, see if you can feel it there, and pull out your arm, you'll see you attach your arm with a hand. And you can take this home. This is your handout for tonight. So if you take your hand and fold your thumb in the middle and put your fingers over the top. My daughter says, don't ever say this, so please don't tell her I said this. It's a handy model of the brain. Um, and anyway, it goes, so the, and we were in your head like this. And so let's just review the parts briefly so we understand what the emotional spark is really about. So this top part of the brain is called the cortex, or outer bark of the brain. If you lift it up, beneath it you'll see the limbic area. You'd have two thumbs would be a perfect model. Most of us just have one. Um, no, I say that because I, I used to just say, well, we all have one thumb. And someone went to a gas station right after the talk, and the person at the, ga the gas station then had two thumbs. And she wrote me a note saying, please, don't just say, keep all have one thumb. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, it's true. So we mostly have one thumb. So you have a left and right side. If you lift up your limbic area, then you have your brain stem. So let's just do a quick neuro review. Um, and these are all reviewed in the brainstorm books and other books and stuff. And then you have your spinal cord is represented in your wrist. And this is attached, of course, inside your body. So um, the way it works is information comes from your heart, your lungs, your intestines, your muscles, your endocrine system, your hormones. And it moves its way up through all sorts of channels, including the spinal cord and other roots. And it's going to influence the deepest parts of the brain which include the brain stem. And the brain stem is a very close relationship to the body. It's regulating your heart rate, it's regulating your intestines, it's regulating your breathing, it also regulates whether you're awake or asleep. It's also even regulating the fight, flight, freeze, and faint response. Deep, deep structures. This is a 300 million year old part of the brain. It develops first in utero, so it's called the oldest part for those two reasons, evolutionarily and developmentally. And when the baby's born, it's pretty much fully developed. Okay, so that's the brain stem. Then on top of the brain stem, we have the mammalian limbic area. So it's only 200 million years old. So it's a newer kid on the block. And it's only half developed, let's say, by the time the baby comes out of the womb. 
So it's going to be in a big way influenced by experience. And so the limbic area has five important functions. One relates to emotional spark. It is very much working with the brainstem and the body to create emotion. So emotion is generated from areas below the cortex. So the way we say that in science is a subcortical, sub meaning below, cortical meaning the cortex. These are the areas below the cortex, the body, the brain, the limbic area. That's where emotion comes from. So when we say the adolescent brain is more emotional, it means if you put a 10-year-old in a scanner and put a 15-year-old in a scanner and put a 45-year-old in a scanner and show them the same stimuli, like a photograph or something, the brain stem and limbic area, including, for example, the amygdala, but the amygdala is just part of a much bigger story, um, they're much more activated in that lesson. They've just got a lot more emotional juice happening. They have a lot more passion. Just go to a restaurant and watch a group of adolescents eating with each other versus a bunch of adults. What do we do? And the adolescents are crying, screaming, yelling, oh, it's beautiful. So that emotional spark is equal to passion. It's equal to passion. Emotion is a long, long, fascinating discussion. You can read about it in the development mind if you want, but the, the bottom line about it is it evokes motion. That's the purpose of emotion, really, to get you to do something. So to get you out of the oatmeal house. The reason, probably, adolescents are more emotional is they gotta evoke more motion. They gotta get out of this house. They gotta have something motivating them, you know, which is another thing that that happens is the brain stem and limbic area work together to motivate you and the motivational circuits change during adolescence. That's number two, so emotion, motivation. The third element of the limbic area is called appraisal. Appraisal just means evaluating whether something is important or not. And if it's not important, you don't pay attention to it. If it's important, you say, is it good? I want more of it. If it's bad, I want to get away from it. Now you tell me, does the motivation and appraisal of an adolescent change once they become an adolescent? In a big way. Because the limbic area is changing, as it should. It's remodeling. It's not raging hormones, it's a remodeling process. Influenced by hormones, sure. And number four is memory. Memory works in some interesting ways. The thing about adolescents, you may recall this, is they start remembering things about their, themselves in an experience, autobiographical memory, in a very different way. It becomes more elaborate. And so I know even now, uh, I can think about all sorts of things I did as an adolescent, but I don't really remember the same depth and richness of thinking of things when I was eight or nine. We start changing the way we think about ourselves in life. And I recently, just parenthetically, someone sent me some old photographs from our adolescent days so I called two of my best friends from when I was 13, 14, and 15. Two guys found them by Googling them. I don't know how I would have found them. Um, and now we, we've uh, decided to have a reunion on Father's Day. We haven't seen each other for 43 years. So it's going to be amazing uh, to do that. So anyway, but we remember, I sent them all the photographs, we remember the details of what happened then. Okay, so memory, and then the third thing is attachment. As we already said, that an adolescent is going to be pushing against attachment figures. They have to get out of the oatmeal house, so they've got to push against those attachment figures. We may feel rejected as parents. And some parents even say, there's something wrong with my kid. He doesn't want to go to the movies with me anymore. No, there's something right with your kid. Now, that, you know, there can be problems in adolescence, for sure, as we'll see. So you see the five basic functions of the limbic area, emotion, motivation, appraisal, memory, and attachment. All of them are changing for a reason. There's a purpose to it. If you interpret that passion, for example, as pathology, the adolescent will think it's pathology and not know how to ride those emotional waves. Instead, what we want to do is teach adolescents, this is a wonderful thing about your brain, to have passion like that, and instead of having them avoid the surf of their waves or being bowled over by their emotions, you can actually teach them what I call mind sight skills 
to have them ride the waves of their emotion. Teach them how to surf, not avoid the water. But what do we do in schools, for the most part, is we don't teach them anything about how to ride the waves of emotion. So let's talk about the downsides and upsides. What's the downside of having a more intense emotional spark going on? Why is that even a problem? What do you think? Okay, we'll get to the danger soon, but it, it, can, it can drive you, it can energize you to do dangerous things, and we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. Um, okay, and that's another one of the essence, and we're gonna, so the issue that was raised was, how do you know what, who's you, and how do you fall into group pressure? And that, that'll be when we get to one of the other ones, that's exactly right. But for emotional spark, how many of you, who once were adolescents, remember being moody. Anybody? Yeah, because it, it comes and goes, it comes and goes. And if you fight an emotion, emotion usually when it rises, it'll stay there for about 90 seconds, and then it'll go away. But if you try to cling on to emotion, or try to push emotion away, it can stay for minutes and hours and days and weeks. Even. So seriously, there's a fundamental mindset practice where you learn to differentiate between the emotion and your identity. And you allow the emotion to just be there. And it arises like a wave and it goes. And those adolescents who do that have a completely different outcome than those who don't have that skill. So you can teach that skill. So moodiness, irritability, right? What's the upside of an emotional spark? We said the reason for it is to get you outside, but what's the upside? No, we'll get to risk taking soon, you're all jumping ahead. You can say risk taking is for something else, and we'll get to that. Because um, you can be emotional and not take risks. You can be optimistic, you can be energized, you can feel vitality. This passion that adolescents feel is something that we pathologize in modern society, but I'll have you consider it is so important to not only have and nourish and cultivate well and learn to use for your benefit as an adolescent, but when we lose it as an adult, life becomes pretty empty. So we'll talk about that soon. So that's the emotional spark. Let's do SE. SE stands for social engagement. The reason adolescents turn toward their peers and not to their parents so much during adolescence, and not all adolescents do, this is true, um, but for the most part, it's a pattern, not just in humans, but in other animals too. Um, the reason we do it is to get out of the oatmeal house. Without other adolescents, you're basically lunch. <laughs> I'm serious. You will survive by being a member of an adolescent group. And that group can be just one other adolescent. You survive in relationship to other adolescents. That's our history. That's our 200 million year adolescent history. So, the reason for it is to allow you to leave the oatmeal house, but to leave the house and not be somebody's lunch. Now, what's the downside? As was mentioned, the downside is you can give up morality in order to gain membership. And that's called peer pressure. And that's a serious, serious, risky thing that happens in adolescents. So, when a, an adolescent comes to you as a parent and says, Mom, Dad, I have to have that shoe. Well, maybe not this shoe, but a shoe that is equally as expensive as the shoe was. You know, and, uh, but, but fancy, but whatever, stylish. I have to have that shoe. And you go, why? Because all my friends in the group have that shoe. Now, you can say, I raised you to be strong, young lady. What's wrong with you, young man? You know, whatever, whatever you say, but you're missing the point. The point is, your child was born with a human brain that comes from millions and millions of years of evolution, where those individuals who didn't try to get that shoe, or the metaphoric equivalent for an antelope, let's say, um, they were lunch, and they didn't go on to make babies. So the ones that said, hey, I'm going to wear that shoe, or I'm going to run with the other antelope adolescents, you know, and that's what I'm going to do, right? And I said, this is good for working the shoe. So you, know, you are... Um, you are actually missing the point. 
that they're speaking from deep in their limbic area and their brainstem, which has the response to threat. And they're saying, I gotta have the shoe. Now, I'm not saying you need to buy the shoe. But you can start at least with understanding that it's not weakness, it's evolution. And your eight-year-old may not have said that, unless they've been watching too much TV or you know, magazines with those pictures of the shoes or something. You know, but a, a, a 14 year old man. So, negotiating how your child's going to understand their inner sensation is crucial. Right? So, that's the downside is they want to gain membership. You know, and they can give up morality, give up common sense, all sorts of things for sure. Absolutely. Now, what's the upside to social engagement? Well, the upside is every single study that's been done on your mental health, even your medical health, your longevity, how long you live, and your happiness, those four kinds of studies, show that the shared common factor across those four spheres that we all like to have in our lives, medical health, mental health, happiness, and longevity, are socially supported relationships. And we learn how to have them outside the home in adolescence. So social engagement, yeah, you don't want to be someone's lunch, that's fine. But it's also teaching you a skill to find like-minded people you can be close to and rely on, to have as sources of support that can last your whole lifetime. You know, and it's like that. When you, if I were to show you these emails that my two friends, Tommy and Elliot, and I are sending back and forth to each other, we're like giggling on, you know, R O L F, rolling, what is it, rolling on the floor laughing? Whatever it is. We're doing this stuff with each other, we're typing, and we have these good night emails to each other. It's, it's a kick, especially. I recently did a Business Insider video that said the importance of not looking at emails at night. And I got a, a note that I have a new thing coming up through Twitter, and, and, and I was looking at it at night and it said, don't look at things at night. And I clicked on it and see what it was, and it was me telling me. Okay? 
when you do something that's rewarding, you know, you get a hit of dopamine. And when the dopamine is secreted, the subjective experience you have in your mind goes, whoa, that was good, I want to do it again. So eating chocolate for many of us is like that. Though my best friend in high school, he hates chocolate, so I don't understand him. <laughs> one thing we don't know about each other, but for many people, chocolate would release dopamine. One of the major things that releases dopamine is novelty. Okay, now that you know that, and we know that nature's got to get this kid out of the oatmeal house, what would you do to the dopamine circuit in the brain, to an adolescent, to get them to want the unfamiliar, unsafe, uncertain, and uncomfortable? Hard to figure out, but this is what they found. What do you think? Think about the reward circuit. And this is truly, you want to say, what's the chemical thing that happens? This is the th chemical thing that really happens in the adolescent brain. Okay, what nature does essentially is, and this is various studies putting together, drops the baseline dopamine level and raises significantly the release level. So that when you do something new, which you're really driven to do because you're kind of bored with a lower dopamine level, and in fact, if dopamine gets too low, it leads to depression. So dropping the level just a little bit just makes you a little footsie. Like, I got something new, you know, I gotta do something. I got something new here, I gotta do something new, something new, like that. <laughs> which is, is great, because you gotta go do something new, you know? And then when you do that new thing, Bam, you get this big hit of dopamine. And you go, whoa, that was great. <laughs> now, spoiler alert, I'm just going to tell you a sad story that I started the book with. When my son was now 25, when he was just almost two, because I remember the day it happened, um, all the streets in our little area where our apartment was were blocked up, which is weird, because usually not many cars at all. And I get a call a few hours later from a friend who told me, um, did you hear that uh, your mentor was killed on this main street? She sent you that girl who walked down. Um, I said, no, it was not. So I called up my mentor's now widow, sadly, and what had happened was a 19-year-old was driving 95 miles an hour down this surface street with a brand new sports car. And hit him head on to kill him. And this young man, uh, two months earlier, had been racing down the same Kirby Street uh, and crashed his car into a tree and was arrested and then released, and his parents just bought him another car. Um, so there's a lot to say about all that stuff. It's a horrible situation all around because this poor adolescent and his parents have to live with the knowledge that he killed a person for the rest of his life. And of course, the whole family of my mentor and all of us in the profession lost a brilliant, brilliant person. Uh, just everyone loses. So why would a 19-year-old do that? And he wasn't on drugs. Why would he do that? Why would someone have a need for speed like that? Well, if think about it like this. This is what the study suggests. You're given a car where the speedometer says you can go to 180 miles an hour. <coughs> You sit in this car with your nice bucket seats, and your friends are watching you in your brand new car, your parents just got here after busting up your own. <laughs> and you want to impress your friends because that will establish you in the hierarchy of membership. Right? And studies show that risk taking behavior in adolescence is way increased when you're around adolescents, or you think adolescents are watching what you're doing, or you think they're going to hear about what you did. Now his friends are watching him, and he goes, I think I can crank this thing up to 130 miles an hour on this curvy surface street. No problem, it's 5 p.m., so this is probably a good time to go down <laughs> the street in the middle of the city. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's typical of adolescents, because number one, they think they're oblivious to something bad happening, right? How many people think that? That adolescents really think they're, what's it called? Omnipotent. 
What is it? It's invincible. invincible. How many people think that's true? That? Well, good. You're not raising your hand. That's good. Actually, when you look at studies of adults and adolescents, this is what Larry Steinberg showed, and they're equal. Adolescents do not feel they're invincible any more than adults feel that way. So that's really an interesting thing. Then you may say, well, um, he's just not informed. Adolescents are so immature. They just don't know that a car going on 30 miles an hour could do something bad. Let's give them lessons on how going faster is more dangerous. Well, actually, that's wrong, too. Adolescents are not only informed about dangers involved in risky behaviors, but they actually overestimate the probability of something bad happening. So let me walk you through what people think goes on. So number one, the lower dopamine level makes this kid have a need for speed. He wants to push the envelope of what's said. Okay, let his parents put him on a race circuit where he's by himself, or teach him how to ski where he's jumping off things and the only person to get hurt is himself. You know, not on a road, but they didn't do that. Okay, that's something we can all take a lesson from. So that's the dopamine story. But there's another story we need to add into this risk-taking behavior, which is changing the appraisal limbic area. And it's a really weird scientific term. I couldn't think of a better one, so I just used the term the scientists use. But it's called hyper-rational thinking. And let me walk you through it. So the dopamine drop and dopamine release elevation gets you to want to do something new. But why would you do something new if you knew it was going to hurt you and you have reasonable thinking? People do. Now, Here's the change. Hyper-rational thinking goes like this, and bear with me. This is the way to think about it. I've got um, a car that can go 180 miles an hour. I bet I can go 130 miles an hour. Maybe I get it up to 100, I don't know. My friends are going to think I am so cool. But you know, this chance something bad could happen, I crashed my car into a tree two months ago, broke up the car, but I got another one, so I guess it's okay. But you know, I'll bet, I could, I'll bet there's a 60% chance I could drive this car 100 miles an hour and be okay. You know, rationally, the most likely outcome of my driving 100 miles an hour is what? It's going to be fine. And he's right. It's hyper-rational. There's nothing intuitive or emotional about it. He's got a 60% chance in his mind, and let's say the reality is he has a 5% chance of getting hurt. 95% chance of not, but he's estimated at 60, and he still does it. Because the statement in his head, the hyper-rational thinking goes like this. The likelihood is it'll be fine. And that linguistic output is accurate. You see how that works? It's hyper-rational. You can say it doesn't make any sense. Of course it doesn't make any sense. But it's logical. It's not intuitive. That is, if he had access to what in the brainstorm book I teach the adolescent to do, which is to gain access to literally, there's a neural network around the intestines. And there's a neural network around the heart, which is beginning to learn about. And there's a pathway of the information processing that gives you a gut feeling or a heartfelt sense in the gut brain and the heart brain that move up a layer of the spinal cord called lamina one, layer one, and it moves up to another area called the insula. And there are research proven <coughs> practices you can do to build that pathway from the intestine and the heart up through lamina one, up to the insula, which goes right to the prefrontal cortex and gives the decision-making motor area of the brain, which is just adjacent to the reasoning area of the brain, input from the wisdom of the body. So this is what, if he had done the training, my hope would be if he had read the book. It would go like this. Got my car, got my friends, it'd be so cool. Whoa. What's the essence of adolescence? Oh yeah, I have a social engagement thing for you. I really want to impress them, but I don't care. You know, I'm going to drive this car, but ooh. I'm saying the likelihood is that I'll do it, but it's true, 60%, it's going to be okay, I'll go do it. Ooh, wait a second. I'm getting this gut feeling like, this doesn't feel right. My heart is telling me, ooh. 
Now, I'm not saying my mommy told me not to do it, and I'm going to push against my mom, or the cop last time said, so I'm driving more carefully, you know, and I'm pushing against the police. So I'm not, it's not about my relationship with adults. It's about my relationship with myself. I call this an internal compass. And if this young man had an internal compass, his own gut feeling, his own heartfelt sense would say, this is wrong. I am not going to do it, even though I had the impulse to do it, even though I thought it was a good idea. I'm now intuiting this is not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of thing that someone learning could understand, that although I have a novelty-seeking thing, I can actually modify my behavior with these mind-side skills. Now, what's the upside of novelty-seeking besides you know, get you out of the house? Why is it helpful to be taking these risks and having the courage? Novelty-seeking is really courage. Really? Creativity. And creativity, you, you guys are like always ahead of the curve. That's where we get to the next one. But yes, <laughs> you can have the courage to do something new, which we'll talk about in the next one. This is great. This is all like segue. It's beautiful. Rhyming the pump. So, what's that? Evolution. Evolution. It's a courage to actually try something new. And when we combine it with creative exploration, you'll see. Think about it this way. Think about it this way. That oatmeal house we talked about. Think about how cozy that is. And now, and the adolescents in the room, you know what I'm talking about, but for us adults, let's remember what it was like. The world out there is not full of loving parents. It's not full of certainty of being hugged or getting a meal. It's pretty scary. Nature's got to give us, as adolescents, the courage to literally do things we've never done before. And I don't mean the creative innovation thing we talk about this, but I mean just something you've never done before. You know, and it's not just like being in third grade going to fourth grade. You're getting ready to launch out into the big world. And the world, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, has never been more rapidly changing and full.